Thank you, worship team. I appreciate you coming this morning and blessing us with music. We're in the Lenten season, and during this time, we have focused on Luke, the 22nd chapter, looking at this final week of Jesus as he prepared for Calvary. Now, I know that there are preachers all across the nation today that are preaching something uh, against fear in the time that we're in and focusing maybe on what we're facing as far as our country and the world. But I've chosen today not to deviate from our current path of this text. And I would say that by the end of this sermon, my hope is is that you would see how this passage actually speaks to the times that we're living in today. So with that said, let's get started. A woman was sharing that she had a particular venue at the local zoo that she loved to go into. That venue, that exhibit, was called House of the Night. Now, it was called that because all the crawling and flying creatures of the night were in that exhibit. And of course, because it was creatures of the night, everything in that exhibit, as you walked in, everything was totally dark. And so one day she said that she was visiting the zoo, and of course she had to go to this exhibit, her favorite. And it was a sunny day, and you know what happens on a sunny day with your eyes. Your eyes constrict, so not to let so much of the sunlight in. And she said as she went to and through the door of the exhibit, as she walked into this total darkness, It was really dark because her eyes were constricted, and as her eyes began to dilate to let in whatever light there were or was in the room, she said she felt a tiny hand slide into her hand. And so she said, I smiled, and I asked this question, and who do you belong to? And she said there was a little boy's voice that quietly said, I'm yours till the lights come on. (laughs) I'm yours till the lights come on. Darkness, we know, is unsettling. It can be uncertainty as we go out into the darkness. I've said before that the highest percentage of crime happens, of course, at night in the darkness, the shadows of darkness. The unknown, the anxiety, causes us to be anxious even when we go out into the dark. There is a condition that actually says that This is true in so many people. It's called the SAD syndrome. And S-A-D, SAD, stands for, the acronym is Seasonal Affective Disorder. And it happens in places like in Alaska or those places where the days are short and the nights are long and you're isolated over the winter months. And so this is actually a true condition, syndrome, that happens. I will be interested to see how the self-isolation in the times we're living in now, uh, where people are having to stay indoors in their house, um, what effects that might have as we move forward, as we see on individuals or even on families. Jesus went out into the darkness this particular night It actually was early Friday morning of this week and he's leaving Jerusalem and he's going to the Mount of Olives and at the Mount of Olives there is a garden called Gethsemane. And so Jesus is leaving Jerusalem and going to this place where he has spent the week with his disciples in the evenings. I think so often we get a picture of this and we overlay it with our society or our culture that we live in. But it was so much different then. There were no street lights in Jerusalem as they went out of the upper room into the darkness of the streets. 
uh, there were no flashlights, there were no headlights, there were no path lights as we have solar lights that light our paths, none of that. In fact, the only thing that they would have for light would most likely be the stars or the moon that would guide them out to the Mount of Olives. Those of you that have served in the military like I have, and have been out at night on maneuvers in the, in the, the forest, in the woods, you know what uh, stars and the moon mean because it can be total darkness, especially when it is overcast. Those of you that camp with scouting and all know what it means to be in the darkness of the woods, outside of the city, outside of where there is light, except those that God has created. So the disciples and Jesus have just finished this Passover meal and they have finished this meal that Jesus said, I earnestly desire to have this meal with you at this time, at this place, and now, because now meant that the plan of fruition to the plan of uh, redemption was going to take place. It is interesting that as they finish the Passover meal, they would sing the Hallel Psalms, these last Psalms, 115 through 118, which are praises to God as they go out into the darkness and as they made their way this night to Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives. Now everything changes. There is darkness, there is temptation, and there is prayer. I hope that in your homes you have your Bibles readily available. And I'll be reading, as I said, from chapter 22 of Luke's Gospel, verses 39 through 46. And he came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he arose from the prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Father, I would pray that you would illuminate our hearts and minds this morning for all that you would hold for us in this passage of your word. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Luke tells us that when he arrived at the place, and we know the place is the Garden of Gethsemane at the Mount of Olives, and he says to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, if you look at the parallel text of this passage in the other Gospels, the uh, Synoptic Gospels, Matthew 26 and Mark 14, you will see that Jesus, yes, took the eleven. Judas has gone and is going to do his thing. He's taken the eleven from the upper room. He's gone to the garden. And where Luke says he left the disciples, Matthew and Mark tell us that he left eight of the disciples and carried Peter, James, and John a little further with him into the garden. And it is here that Jesus charges them, as Matthew and Mark records, that Jesus charges Peter, James, and John to watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. What was the temptation that Jesus was charging them, challenging them not to fall into? 
Well, many have said that it is denial, that the temptation was that they were going to deny him. And we know that Matthew tells us in the 26th chapter and the 56th verse that they all fled at his arrest. But we know that Peter followed Jesus to the courtyard. We know from last week's sermon that Peter is going to deny Jesus. Jesus has told Peter that he will deny him. John tells us that there was a second disciple that followed along. John 18.15 says, Yet still another disciple followed Peter. He didn't go into the courtyard, and we know this to be John, as John is the only one that reflects this in the gospel. But we know that the disciples fled, and we know that Peter denied. So is it that Jesus is challenging them in this prayer to pray that the temptation for denial would go and cease from them? Maybe. But what if? Just what if Jesus was challenging them to avoid, avoid the temptation that God, that Jesus was going to abandon them? What if the tempting here was the feeling of being abandoned, that Jesus was trying to get them to avoid this temptation. It's interesting, we know after the crucifixion that they knew Jesus was dead. They knew that he was carried to the tomb. They knew that he was buried. They knew he was gone. It would have been something like, okay, God, what's up with this? You know, we spent three years following this man. We left everything. We left our family. We left our job. We left everything to follow this who says he was your son, and now we feel abandoned. When the two came back from the Emmaus, the road to Emmaus, they had gone home. They had been with Jesus. He had appeared to them. And they came back that night, and they entered the upper room, and what did they find? Despair. Yes, Peter and, and John had run to the tomb and they had seen that the tomb was empty, but they did not understand what was going on yet. It would be later that night that Jesus would appear to them. But the two from Emmaus found despair. They found anxiety. They found men in an upper room that just did not know what was happening. Could it have been that Jesus was saying, pray that you fall not into the temptation of abandonment? This is going to be a three tough days, guys. This is three tough days. But believe me, it's going to end well. When we face darkness, the uncertainty, folks, we need to pray that we do not fall into the temptation that God has abandoned us. He has not. The very Holy Spirit that we claim in the good times, we also should claim in those times of trial, those bad times that we face, because God has not gone anywhere. He is present with us. Claiming God's presence does not mean things will be perfect. There will still be heartache. There will still be stress. There will be sickness. There will be dark times that we will face. But you can be certain that you have not been abandoned. The Hebrew writer says that he will never uh, leave us or forsake us. Jesus has faced all that we would face and found even peace as he is going to make his way to the cross in the midst of our trials, claim the presence of Jesus Christ. Jesus is asking them to pray that he will be sufficient, that his will for them will be sufficient. And unfortunately, they couldn't do that. They fell asleep instead of praying. 
Don't fall asleep, folks. Don't fall asleep. As Amy said in her prayer, now is the time to pray. If ever there's a time, now is a time. God wants us to pray. He wants to hear from us. In our temptations, in our trials, in our dark times, in the good times, giving thanks, He gave us an example in the Lord's Prayer that we are to pray, and we are to give thanks to Him, and we are to ask that His will be done in all things. I don't want to hear someone say, I don't know how to pray, or God knows what I'm thinking, so I don't need to pray, or others are praying, I don't need to pray. No, you need to pray now and always need to pray. In fact, God wants you to pray in the midst of the darkness. The lesson is clear. If Jesus does not face His temptations without going to the Lord in prayer, then why shouldn't His disciples? Why shouldn't us? Why shouldn't we? as Christians, do the same thing. Those who would pray properly would empty themselves of self-confidence, of spiritual pride, of overestimating my own strength. We are actually to empty ourselves as Jesus emptied Himself when we call on God for divine help. I want you to hear this, the words that be on the screen. Jesus' words are a warning against being caught prayerless when the full force of temptation hits and are a promise that help awaits those who pray. We must pray. We must in the good and the bad, in the dark and in the light, we must pray. And Jesus sets the example. He sets a wonderful example for us as we look at this text. Because you see, in Matthew's Gospel and in Mark's Gospel, Jesus tells the three that takes he takes a little bit further. He says, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. This is how grieved Jesus is in His humanity. Fully human, fully divine at the same time. He is grieved to the point of death about what is to come. Matthew says it that and a little bit more. He says that He is grieved and distressed. And what does He do in the garden? He goes a stone's throw further than He leaves the disciples and He falls prostrate on the ground. He falls on his face. At this point in time, the mode of prayer would be to stand and to offer your prayers to God. And here Jesus, he doesn't just stand, he doesn't just kneel, but Matthew tells us he falls on his face to the ground and cries out in agony this night to his Father in heaven. In fact, Luke tells us in verse 53 that Jesus says, this is the hour, this is the time, and there's that word, darkness. This is the power of darkness. Jesus prays through His temptation as He is prostrate on the ground. We know that Jesus did not sin. We can look at the Scriptures, just a couple, John 5, 19, verse 19 and verse 30. The Hebrew writer in 4, 15 says that Jesus is without sin, and we know in His full divinity He was without sin. But He could be tempted. And we know that because the Hebrew writer in 2, 17 and 18 tells us that He was tempted, yet without sin. And so we know that the Lord in the wilderness was tempted, and here in the garden, He was tempted. But I want to tell you something that maybe you haven't realized. His temptation is different. The temptation the Lord faced, however, is different than what we as believers 
face. You say, wait a minute, time out. Uh, the scripture says he's faced everything that we've faced, and yet, without sin, he understands our grief. He understands all that we would go through. Well, hold to that, and that is true. But I want you to hear what I mean by this, that his temptation in the wilderness and in the, dar in the darkness of the garden were different. Christians, as we come to faith in Jesus Christ, are a new creation. A new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But, we are easily seduced by the remnants of our fallenness, of our fallen nature. Satan tempts the believer to hold on to sin. So our fight is this. Our fight is against the attraction to sin and to abandon it. We fight against that as believers because we want to embrace purity, holiness, righteousness as believers. But Satan's temptation of Christ was just the opposite. Christ was perfectly pure, perfectly holy, perfectly righteous. His absolute holiness motivated everything he said, everything he did, all of his word and deeds. And so while the believer struggles to abandon sin and embrace holiness, Jesus' struggle was to set aside his holiness and embrace sin. He was not fighting against sinful impulses to become holy like we are, but he was against the impulses in his holiness to allow himself to take on the sin of the world. This is the difference in the temptation. Satan tempts Christians to cling to sin. He was tempting Jesus to cling to to his holiness. In other words, he was looking at this as a last chance to try to thwart this plan of salvation, this redemptive plan that God had set in place. He prayed on Jesus' human nature. Jesus, don't go through with this. Jesus, it's okay. Jesus, you don't have to take on the sin of the world. You can walk away from this, Jesus. Just keep your holiness and righteousness. That's not our problem. We're trying to seek to be holy. Jesus was going to have the sin of the world laid on him. And so he was going to have to set aside his holiness. We hear Jesus plea. Father, Abba, Father, take this cup from me. It's interesting that Jesus uses these words, this cup, because he has just celebrated the Passover meal with the disciples just a few hours earlier, and he was there with them as the cup of redemption, this third cup was shared, and now he becomes that cup poured out, his blood shed. His blood. For the sins of the world. He was in agony. He was in distress. Make, make no bones about it. As he laid in the garden that night. This agony and this distress caused him to begin to sweat drops of blood. This can happen. This condition is called hematohydrosis, and it's where the, the sweat uh, glands are surrounded with uh, these blood vessels and in stress or distress as these blood vessels dilate and they can rupture and the blood can mingle with the sweat and the sweat can come out as drops of blood. Jesus was in agony knowing what he was going to face the trial that was ahead of him. 
He was even in such agony that God sent an angel from heaven to strengthen him. How about that? Jesus, in the midst of his greatest trial, said these words, Not my will, but thine. Max Lucata, in his book, And the Angels Were Silent, wrote this, and I'm quoting Max, and then I want to give some commentary to what he says, because some of you will say, Whoa, wait a minute. I quote, the battle is won. You might have thought it was won at Golgotha. It wasn't. You might have thought the sign of victory is the empty tomb. It isn't. The final battle was won at Gethsemane. And the sign of conquest is Jesus at peace in the olive trees. For it was in the garden that he made this decision that he would rather go to hell for you than to go to heaven without you. Wow. End of quote. So listen to me. Our victory is Calvary. Our sins were laid on Jesus Christ. Our victory in eternal life, life after death, was the empty tomb. But for Jesus, his victory was in the garden. Because at this point, when he lays it all on the line, take this cup from me. He says, not my will, but yours, Father. Jesus, unlike the disciples in the garden that night, was able to submit to his Father. Here is where the battle was won for Jesus. When his disciples ask him to teach them how to pray, he used this same phrase, thy will be done. Jesus says, thy will be done. And he arose from this prayer because he knew what was ahead. And believe it or not, as you read the rest of the story, you will see as Jesus leaves the garden, he has a sense of peace. His Father is with him. Even though he will be put on trial, not one time, but several times over the next hours. Though Pilate will have a Roman cohort beat him one lick, sly, sly of death in flogging him ripping his flesh. He was forced to carry his own cross member of the cross on the streets of Jerusalem, falling on the road to Golgotha. It is at Golgotha where they used nails to nail him to the cross. It is there where he hung for six hours. It is there where our sin was poured into him. It is there where he was abandoned. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the sin of the world was poured into our Savior. It is there He took on our sin. It is any wonder that Jesus sweat, sweat drops of blood in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the place of the final battle. Jesus comes before the Father and He pleads and He begs and He wrestles with Him. And He says, Abba, Father, take this cup from Me. And guess what? God says, no. Nope. Not going to happen. The plan is going to fruition. You realize how hard that might be for Jesus to hear? In the three years that He was in ministry, Every time he prayed to his Father in heaven, it was yes and amen. Sight was given to the blind. There were people that were healed, those raised from the dead. The storm was calmed on the sea. He was there when God chose for him, his disciples, those that would follow him, where their hearts were transformed 
those who would be later proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus comes to a point where what he wants and what needs to happen are two different things. You remember the toning at the cross where Jesus is asked, if you're the Christ, save yourself, save us. There lies the agony of this night for Jesus. Because you see, this was the impossible thing. Jesus could not save Himself and us at the same time. This hour did not pass Him by. Neither will the hour Neither will the hour of our testing as long as we live on this earth. Sooner or later, every one of us, if we haven't yet, we will find our Gethsemane. We will find that time where we have to cry out in prayer. We have to cry out to Lord God, please take this cup from me. It may be in a hospital waiting room. It may be in a courtroom. It may be on the end of that dreaded call that you have never wanted to take. It may be in the loneliness of pain or isolation. It could be in the facing injustice, the darkness of grief, or even the betrayal of someone that is closest to you. There are long nights that we may pace the floor and cry to a point where there are no more tears. There's a point where what we want and what we love and what happens to be are two different things, just like Jesus. Here we need to pray. When we find ourselves in the darkness, we need to pray. But you say, well, Marty, there's times where there just isn't words. I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to offer that prayer crying out to God. A missionary tells this story. He said there was a little child in the village where he was ministering, and he came upon this child. This child had only at this age in their life had learned the alphabet. And so he said, I came upon her and she was in the attitude of prayer. And she was reciting the alphabet. So he came up to her and he said, I said to the little girl, what are you doing? She said, I'm praying. He said, well, why are you repeating the alphabet over and over again? And her response was, well, I felt that I should pray, but I didn't know how. But I knew that if I repeated the letters of the alphabet, that the Lord would know how to fit those letters together in the words that He needed to hear. You know, sometimes we run out of words. And the Bible tells us in fact, Paul in Romans tells us where the Spirit Himself intercedes for us. He intercedes with groanings too deep for words. You see, we have this indwelling Spirit in us. This Spirit of the living God. And when we go to Him in prayer, the Holy Spirit that dwells in us will take our thoughts and our words, may, though they may be nothing more than repetition, God will take those and He will hear our heart. You say, well, Marty, and today, what we're facing today is just unprecedented. Well, actually, it's not. It's not in society and it's not in the church. And I'll just give you two examples of darkness. In the third century, mid third century, it was said that. 5,000 people a day in the city of Rome died due to sickness. 
Now, we know that that was a virus, a disease that overtook that area. 5,000 a day in the city of Rome, mid-third century. And what did the church do? The church prayed. In the 17th century, the mid-1600s, a pastor recorded in his journal, he lived in Germany in a town where he says, every day I was doing 50 funerals in my town from those that passed away from sickness. It's not an unprecedented time. We live in a fallen world. And we know that in this fallen world, there are going to be trials. There are going to be times that we have to face. And while God wants us to pray in the good times, He certainly wants us to fall prostrate when temptation comes to think that He has abandoned us. He has not. He did not abandon Jesus. Jesus was there when God said, No. So the question would be, if God, Jesus knew that God was going to say no, why did He pray at all? Why did Jesus offer this prayer when unlike us, He already knew what the answer would be? His prayer is about being with the Father. In the moment of grief, in the moment of this terror, in the moment of this loneliness, in the moment of knowing despair to the point of death, Jesus seeks out His Father and He pours out His soul to Him in prayer. If this is the example of Jesus, should it not be the example of of us. Shouldn't we pour out our soul to Him, seeking the Father? You see, it's like this for us. Jesus wants to say to us, like the, the little boy that slid his hand into the woman's hand in the dark exhibit in the zoo, Jesus wants us to say to Him, I am yours until the lights come on. And the lights for us is eternity. Because you see, in eternity there will be no more darkness for Jesus is light. And there will always be light. In Him there is no more crying, no more pain. Jesus wants us to slide our hand into His hand and to hold on tight to Him. To lean into Him knowing that He will not abandon us ever and certainly not in our time of need. Jesus set the example. We will all have our Gethsemanes. It may not be through what we're facing today, but we will have them. I would encourage you to hold on to the Savior until the lights come on. For you. Father.